And let's start with Colin. This guy says, hey, Frank, thanks for being the voice of reason throughout this pandemic. It truly is refreshing to see someone like yourself not promoting all the fear-mongering and hatred like the mainstream media. <laughs> thanks. Appreciate that. Because the narratives keep getting holes poked through them, but many people are still unable to read between the lines. Just nice to know there's still some voice of reason out there. I really appreciate that. Because we've been following this Evergrande scandal in the news, and I'm starting to get concerned that their bankruptcy is going to have an international ripple effect throughout the markets. Do you think this could be a similar outcome as 2009? Thanks. It's not going to be a ripple effect since we pretty much know the full extent of the damage and how much debt they have. Now, we didn't... I'm saying that right now, and it appeared. Could I be wrong on that? Yes, it could be even, you know, who knows? It's China, and they're not going to tell you anyway, right? Just like they still, you know, the Wuhan thing, no one's allowed in there and stuff like that, right? They can do whatever they want. But in 2009, nobody knew. And the Fed had absolutely no clue what was going on. I mean, it let, if it had any clue, it would have never let Lehman fail, because that's a really, really collapsed system. That's when everyone started calling Goldman, or like everything's frozen, commercial paper markets, for everything's frozen, nothing's working. They didn't even know. They didn't even know the extent to AIG, nothing. So when you can't see the problem, you can't really fix it, right? It's those problems you can't see, like, like how bad COVID was where, I mean, I was showing you Goldman report saying this is just going to be a quick dip in GDP for one quarter. And I was like, you're absolutely crazy. This is insane. There's no way it's going to be a quick dip. And sure enough, it, it hurt GDP for a year, year and a half. And you can say, well, we had a V-shaped recovery because we injected $11 trillion into the market, which is insane. I mean, of course, you know, it, it's, you know, if you're not working, you're making, uh, say, $50,000 a year, and all of a sudden you lose your job, and the government says, oh, well, he's a check for $50,000, nothing really changes. That was okay. It helped the markets bounce back, and now we took on a massive amount of debt, and you res the result is, you know, a lot of consequences, people staying home, getting paid more than if they worked and stuff. So, you know, craziness. But it's a problem you can't fix, right? That, that, that you don't know, not that you can't fix, that you really don't know to full extent. So when it came to the credit crisis, nobody knew how much leverage these banks to, took on. I mean, I mean, you know, maybe a couple people tried, started figuring out. But when I say nobody, in terms of the Fed or regulatory authorities, they had no clue what was going on. But this problem we could see. I mean, China's government's going to make sure this doesn't crash the system. Luckily, sell its assets to, to other companies, other bidders, or backstop the debt. But this is more like a long-term credit problem than a 2000. 2008-2009 credit crisis that's going to impact, you know, the global economy. No. And you're seeing that already. I mean, look, look we, I mean, Evergrande wouldn't be up right now, but could there be more to this? Yes. I mean, I dug in and saw who has exposure. Not a lot of U.S. banks have very little exposure. A lot of the banks in, in China, the creditors, large banks, do have exposure. It is a huge market, but they pretty much know the extent of this and the debt payments and, and what needs to be made. And it's not like you have to bail out the whole... 300 billion at the same time, it's just making those debt payments. You could probably, the equity is probably going to be wiped out. And, and you know, you, you strike a bargain with the creditors and say, hey, it's either nothing or whatever, 40 cents on the dollar, whatever. They'll be like, okay, and everything is good. And then the government will probably take most of these assets. And in five years from now, they're going to make a fortune off of it. That's how it goes. As crazy as it sounds. But no, I wouldn't worry about it. Like I said, inflation's a much, much bigger concern here now that the supply chain problems are lasting through 2023 now, we're hearing, or in, well into 2023. And now finally they're catching up with these reports and, and they had a list you know, of CEOs. I break this, I'm going to break this down uh, later on in um, a newsletter, which you guys are going to get uh, on Wednesday, which is the Curzio Venture Opportunity Newsletter. I'm going to break down. Like, you, know, you listen to some of these CEOs, major CEOs, guys that you heard of, and this is from last quarter. Just have a couple quotes there uh, of how they said, wow, this surprised the hell out of us. We can't believe this still, you know, a mass bottleneck. And even FedEx, if you look yesterday, Late, late last night said they're raising prices. They put it out as late as possible. We're raising prices by a largest percentage of a largest amount in, in 10 years. That's crazy. That doesn't sound like inflation is transitory to me. It just doesn't. That's the biggest concern because that's the one thing the Fed can't throw money at to fix. They got to take money out of the system. And we're going to see if they're going to mention any of that on the next couple of days, the Fed meeting and tapering and when all that stuff's going to happen. But as far as this situation at Evergrande? No. I, I don't see it. I think this is going to disappear, this story. You know, you might hear more news of how China's handling it, but I really don't think it's a big deal. And I think it was much more led to that sell off on Monday, not just this. Not just this. I think it was everything combined, people nervous, risk, you know, taking risk off, just risk off market. 
And I could tell you from someone who watches the inflows, outflows, a lot of money flowed into China over the past two, three weeks, a ton of money. And I think a lot of that money rushed out of that market right away. So you're looking to buy an opportunity with China and everything and going into other industries. I got a question on that in a minute. But probably a lot of money just reversing course, forcing a huge pullback. And then all the fear, systemic risk, holy cow, and people just start selling stuff and, and going crazy. So uh, the real story is I don't think this is going to be a, a, a big deal. There's much bigger concerns like inflation for U.S. investors and stuff like that. And I don't think this is going to be a ripple effect and filter over to the global economy. So thanks for that email, Colin. So the next question is from... I should do this guy's initials. So it is HR because he has a unique name. I don't want to, everybody, I always want to hide that name. Never say the last name. But anyway, HR, he goes, Frank, is China trying to destroy the world's economy? I don't get his stance on regulating every industry since it will lead to fewer foreign investments, especially from the US. Uh, and also leads to eventually slowing their economy, which is happening right now. You're right, it is happening. So yeah, should we be selling everything China? And thanks for all you do. Uh, no. Don't sell China. In fact, I think it's a buy. I know it's crazy. <laughs> you probably said, wait a minute, are you nuts? You're buying with all this uncertainty. Hear me out first. Hear me out. I'm not just, you know, I usually, not usually, 100% of the time, I'm always going to have a thesis behind what I'm saying. I'm not just going to say, well, I think you got a shot here, and yeah, it could go, and if it doesn't, no. Here's, here's why I think China's a buy. Over the past few months, what have we seen? China cracked down on Ant Group and Didi, saying they pose financial security, cyber risk, and things like that. Alibaba, where antitrust laws are broken. Online gaming restrictions for kids, right? You could go on, was it uh, three hours a week or something like that? Tighter conditions on Macau and gambling, which is hurting wind, because those concessions that they got is one of the three. So foreign suppliers of foreign uh, companies, along with Las Vegas Sands and... MGM were allowed to build casinos in Macau, but you know they're probably going to dial back a little bit and say, hey, we're not going to give you all these concessions. So you've seen those stocks get nailed. And everyone's like, wow, China's going crazy. This shit. They're not. They're, they're not actually going crazy. If you look at these measures, they're targeting just a few industries. You have that you know, technology where they're targeting just technology from security standpoint. They're targeting education. And then the video game sectors and almost like the entertainment part of the business. So basically attacking behavioral issues tied to social media, tied to the education of their kids, who they believe are wasting valuable time watching stupid shit and celebrities on social media, which I think we could all agree with. I could definitely agree with my kids. I, I, it's getting to the point I have to take the TVs away. The stuff that we're watching on YouTube is a joke. I mean, social media, the way it, 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 it's geared to just totally, again, they're a customer. They're a click. They're just like anybody else. And these are kids that are going to watch stuff for four or five hours and, and play video games for 10 hours. Yeah, and that's what you want to see. Advertisers want to see. How long are they going to be on your site? That's where you get it from, that younger generation who has the time, who, you know, just after school, they got much more time, especially in the summer when they're off of school, compared to people that are working. Those numbers get filtered in with all the other numbers. But China's really going after that part of the industry. And I got to be honest with you, I, I kind of like it. I mean, you're not seeing China crack down on Apple. You're not seeing China crack down on Qualcomm, where 47% of its sales come from, or Intel, 27% of its sales. China's not cracking down on Nike. Hotel chains, Hilton, Marriott, McDonald's, Starbucks, they're not cracking down on it. It's not like, hey, this thing, personal thing against the U.S., where U.S. companies are like, holy shit, should we restructure a few things and get out of China? No, it's not like that. It, it, it's the areas that, they're notable sectors of the economy. And the reason why it's getting huge, huge headlines is because that's the sectors that everyone knows and they're most talked about in high-flying stocks like Tencent, Alibaba, Didi, Wynn, Las Vegas Sands. People are familiar with all those stocks. But remember, China is the growth engine of the world and they know this. And it's only going to grow if it's on good terms with developed nations who are the richest like Europe and of course the U.S., they're going to make a lot of noise like they did with tariffs. When we talk about tariffs. I wrote a whole entire report on it. I think it was a 20-page report saying, stop worrying about this. It's the biggest buying opportunity ever. And people are like, it's a trade war and globalism. And we'll get Listen, China has no choice. They could say whatever they want. They're barking. They're supposed to bark just like everybody else. They have no choice. They make the goods, which is cool. 
We're the ones that pay for them. We could buy them anywhere. Yes, it would be more expensive to buy them in other places, but China isn't going to be able to sell those products to anybody else. So they have to comply. They're not going to tell you they're going to comply, but they have to. That's why tariff, right? it's gone. It's not even an issue, tariffs. Not even an issue. Not, not to mention they've thrown out, you know, hundreds of billions and this and that, which is, it's nothing. It's basically nothing. It resulted in nothing. There's like one or two companies. Whirlpool tried to say it, it hurt, the, you know, Whirlpool was just crashing at the time. But most companies didn't get impacted by that. And everything worked out perfectly fine. But if you look, you'd probably see at least 100 million stories over the past, what, that year? Or was it end of 2018, I think, 2019? On it. Warning you, telling you it's crazy. And we use it as buying opportunities. It's fantastic. But China's smart. They're going to make noise about all this. Again, just like they do with tariffs. But if you're looking at China and they want to remain a powerhouse, one, it needs us. Two, it's not going to start picking and choosing what business can operate there, going after McDonald's or Nike. It's just, why would we do that for? Now we're going to, you know, th that's going to discourage foreign investment. But the most important thing is they're focusing on education and they believe that that's how they become the dominant. The dominant country in the world is education. And they're getting their kids off of all this bullshit and saying, hey, we need you to focus on that education because that's the long term. That's what China's looking at, a long term plan. So they come out the five year growth plan or whatever for five years. That's the plan for them. If you notice, that's the sectors that they're targeting. Again, you hear me talk negative about China and the government all the time. I love China when I went there. I love the people talking about the government and investment. Just like when I talk about California and the shit's going on there. I love California. I have a lot of subscribers to California. I love the people there. I just hate the fact that. You know, a lot of bullshit goes on with, with, with politics. When it comes to China, listen, they, to me, they're doing the right thing. But the story no one's really saying is that they're not targeting all this U.S. and destroying all the businesses. It, it's kind of like, hey, we need to dial this back, get our kids back on track with education. And that's how we could completely dominate the world by having the smartest people. And, and, and that's kind of what they're doing. And, and for me, I think China's a buy because that story's not being told. It's like, wow, the uncertainty China, look what they're attacking. Look at Didi, how much is down. But all of this is about entertainment, bullshit, video games, gambling, which is by getting, you know, not providing those concessions to, to win in Las Vegas, Sands, MGM, means more money they get to keep. So they're not like, like crushing every single industry. They're just targeting certain industries. So, so I don't think China's trying to destroy the, the, themselves. They're not. They need foreign capital. They need people to continue to buy their goods, which they could produce super cheap. But that's the story on China. I think China's going to be a buy. It's just be careful of the sector. I wouldn't go to Tencent, social media, the crackdowns. That could hurt our gaming industry. We haven't seen it yet. Let's see if they report that. It's a big deal. Kids going on like 10 hours a day opposed to three hours a week. It's going to impact certain industries. Win the Las Vegas Sands. But other companies with their growth plans, you know, again, they're the growth engine of the world, accounting for 40% of the world's growth facing GDP. They're not going to do anything stupid to get rid of that. That would be, you know, not in their best interest. And remember, it's all about money, all about power. This is what they're doing. They're not going after all companies in the U.S. They're just going in some, in some sectors, and the sectors that are targeting just interesting. They're like, this is all bullshit. You don't need this. It's not going to make you smarter. And let's focus on the educational part. So I kind of like that. I think it's going to open up an opportunity for you to really make some investments in China. And we might go there pretty soon. Okay, last question here really quick. I like to keep these 30 minutes from Glenn. He goes, good morning, Frank. I clearly understand the systemic risk regarding non-crypto securities like today's China property fears. However, can you please tell me what specific types of systemic risks would affect the crypto securities such as, and I'm not going to give it away because it was one of our, it was the latest pick in, in our crypto intelligence newsletter. But the systemic risk for cryptos is regulation, where the SEC could deem all crypto securities. And if they do that, all of these companies are going to need to come out of the U.S. and you're not going to be able to buy them anymore because they all are securities, but none of them want to operate as security because then they got to report the financials and they got to report everything and they don't want to report anything. A lot of them took that cash, bought Lamborghinis, bought homes, you don't know any of that stuff, right? So... The fact they have to report that, they can't. They'll all get arrested. Most of these kids will get arrested. So I'd say 80% of the industry would, would, at least 80% of the industry would be in big trouble. And they're not going to report if they don't have to. So they'll just say, okay, we're not going to trade in the US anymore, which would be bad for Coinbase. You could trade on Kraken and, and Gemini and stuff like that. 
That's the biggest thing that could hurt the entire industry because now you're taking money out of the system. And remember, this is an alternative. Bitcoin, Ethereum, especially Bitcoin is a currency. It's a currency now. It's accepted in so many different places as forms of payment. I mean, everywhere it's becoming more adopted by the weak and MasterCard, all the payment plans, PayPal, Square, everyone. They, they have to get in. It's a $2 trillion market, and yeah, they have no choice but to get in it. So it, it, it threatens governments. It does. So that's one of the biggest fears. Ray Dalio said, listen, if Bitcoin gets even bigger, he thinks the government could come after. I'm not there. But they could deem a lot of these things securities because Coinbase, they started that Lend business. And they were about to start it. And SC said, you're not allowed to do that. You can't you know, lend through crypto, which is amazing. So the SC said, we're going to sue you if they launch it. And, and Coinbase decided to scrap those plays, scrap them yesterday and said, okay, we're not going to do it. And it's crazy considering literally hundreds of crypto companies are doing the exact same thing right now. These are leading cryptos. Providing above average interest, like BlockFi, Salt Lending, Unchained Capital, Coin Loan, Celsius, Nexo, Binance, Kraken, KuCoin, CoinList, a bunch of them, bunch of them, ton of them. You're telling the biggest guy that they can't do this, what are they going to, you can't let these guys do it? I'd be shaking in my boots if I'm these guys. That's their business model. That's where they make the most money here. What are they going to do? So you want to talk about systemic risk. It, it comes from the government that could really impact a ton of these things, which is going to impact a lot of different, I don't think it's going to happen right away. But after what they said to Coinbase, I mean, you're telling them that they're not allowed to do something that 100 companies are doing in the U.S. right now. That's something that worries me. We're not in any of those companies within our crypto intelligence news. They're still doing very, very good, even though crypto has pulled back a little bit more. I'm going to use it as a buying opportunity because I'm a big believer in crypto. A big believer in crypto. So all those I explained technically should, you know, all those companies could should be getting sued by the SEC based on what they said about Lend. And that's the biggest risk, I think. And you can say that's systemic risk because it will impact the entire industry. It will. If money from the U.S. No, comes out of this market, yes, you're going to see a lot of these things fall. I don't think it's going to happen soon, but it could definitely happen.